everybody. Welcome to Winsight Live. I'm John Springer of Winsight Grocery Business here in New York. We've got a full house today with my colleagues Kat Martin and Jen Straley of Winsight Grocery Business, Brett Dworsky of CSP, and joining us for the first time and hopefully for the first of many times, Pat Kobe from our restaurant business brand. Also, as always, the supermarket guru, Phil Lampert. Phil, let's begin. Last 24 hours, Walmart, CDS, Kohl's, Target, uh, Kroger have all announced uh, policies to a, to make their customers wear masks in stores mandatory. Thank you, Phil, for putting that mask on. Uh, we're in a we do it here at Winsight Live also. So, <laughs> you know, everybody has to start wearing their mask. <laughs> it's uh, uh, astonishing that retailers have to come and step up where federal, local, state authorities have not. And it's already engendering some controversy in places like Georgia, where they're saying, well, we're not, the, the governor there is saying that local uh, communities cannot legally enforce mandatory masks. What a mess. I, I say it every week. What a mess. It is. And, and what's interesting to me is yesterday, I think um, it was either MSNBC or CNN, um, you know, they, they were talking to some mayors. Um, around the country who have um, made masks mandatory and they're, um, they're spiraling down. I mean, this is not rocket science as, as you, John, have said you know, numerous times. Um, what's the big deal about wearing a mask? I just don't get it. And especially now where, you, uh, I mean, I'm getting probably 10 emails a day from different providers of masks that got great designs on them. Some of them are funny. Um, I, I just don't get it. I'm, I'm with you on this. Yeah, and you know, Target has said uh, that it would offer free masks disposable masks to guests that arrive without one. Um, I know that uh, Walmart's Sam's Club is doing the same. I'm not sure about the logistics of, of doing it for the traffic of the size of a, a company like Walmart or Kroger, but, but um, I mean, it just makes sense, you know? And, and geez, we did it here in, in New York at the onset of the pandemic. Yep. And it is as normal as putting on your pants now, uh, you're going outside. And the fact that the, the country has sort of resisted this is just, baffling and and dangerous yeah so, and to phil's point you know it it really it, it would help if it were a, a government issue because you know the ufcw sent out a press release yesterday talking about kroger making masks mandatory for for shoppers and they said that 50 percent of, of governors still refuse to issue a mask mandate but the good news is the oklahoma governor um has tested positive so, you know, but, but he's, he's still, still not, he's still saying that he's not going to mandate masks. Yep. So, <laughs> you know. so, so two things. One is Palm Beach County in Florida, um, which is like 2000 square miles or something like that. I, I heard the mayor yesterday talking. What they've done is they've mailed to every Palm Beach resident. And that's where obviously Mar-a-Lago is located as well. Um, two cloth masks and two disposable masks through the mail. Um, I think it goes out tomorrow to everybody. And also, uh, we just did a story about a Michigan grocer, a small Michigan grocer who's in a town of, I think, 725 people. Um, what they have outside is they've got hand sanitizer outside if you're going to go into the grocery store. And they have free masks, cloth masks that somebody is donating that you take you bring home, it's yours forever, and, and you wash it and clean it. And if you don't have it, you, you can't get into the store. But, you know, talking, talking about people who don't wear masks, uh, Boris Johnson in, in the UK is doing something very, very interesting. Um, there's uh, some groups called Action on Sugar, Action on Salt, and 47 other health charities are demanding that the government include a ban on showing of junk food advertisements before 9 p.m. Uh, Actually, Boris Johnson is expected to announce a ban on supermarket promotions of unhealthy food as part of a wider strategy to tackle the nation's obesity problem. So, you know, that would be good, but he also needs to wear a mask, being one of the people who were infected with COVID-19. Um, also, Zagat is out with their new Future of Dining study. And just a couple of highlights real quick. Uh, three in four diners cite health and safety concerns as the biggest deferred to dining out again, far outweighing financial reasons. 
83% of those not immediately comfortable with returning to restaurants will be made more comfortable with social distancing and masks worn by staff. And 93% will wait more than three weeks after opening of a restaurant to go there. Um, what do we think is going to happen with grocerants in, in supermarkets? Um, you know, grocerants was a big trend. We started to see a lot of retailers adding them right now, at least here in Southern California. They're empty. Uh, they're, they're being used for weird displays of, of non-food products. Uh, do we think the grocerants are, are going to reopen? Um, John, what do you think? Yeah, Phil, uh, hard to say. I mean, I, I know that the, the supermarkets are, are working at the very hardest at providing meals, but in a package form. And, and you know, we, we've seen that. You know, one of the things I've been looking at, um, you know, several months ago, Kroger and Cluster Truck, this uh, yep. uh, ghost kitchen facility out of Indianapolis announced an interesting deal. That's the kind of thing I, you would expect that, you know, supermarkets could have done in this in this. COVID period when the when the restaurants were shut down to kind of build up that kind of meal business. Um, but, you know, longer term, uh, you know, I think I think these things are just on pause like a lot of other things in our lives. And, and uh, we'll see what happens in the next couple of months if we can get our arms around the, the health pandemic. So, Pat, from the food service side, um, and, and I'm sure, you know, uh, food service operators are scrambling to try to figure out what to do. Are we seeing more food service people, you know, working with supermarkets to create grocerants? I know Wolfgang Puck has done that extensively. Are there others that, that are doing it? I know Wahlburgers has done it with, with Hy-Vee. Are the restaurants, the food service side, really stepping up to take over those grocerants? Well, at the beginning of the pandemic, I know uh, chefs stepped in and made uh, to-go meals that were available in supermarkets because their restaurants were closed. I think at this point, um, they're trying to just stay in business and open their restaurants again. But I think there, there's always been a close partnership between certain chefs and restaurants. And I think they're doing more of these branded to-go meals because they got used to it during the pandemic and they're going to continue. One of the things that we're seeing, we've talked a lot about, you know, olive bars and salad bars being a thing of the past. Uh, but now what we're starting to see is a lot of those prepared foods being just placed in ugly plastic plates in the salad bars because they don't know what else to do with them. But uh, Heinen's, um, I'm very excited about. Uh, we did this story, I don't know, two or three years ago, has actually bought Sally, uh, the, the uh, salad robot. Um, and, and we're going to put up a picture of it. And Heinen's is going to roll out these, you know, automatic robots that make salads on demand for, for their customers. So that's going to be at least their um, attempt at trying to recreate the salad bar, at least to go. And Food & Wine magazine um, has named the 10 best supermarkets um, in the country. So we'll, we'll vote on who we think is best, but let me, well, why, why don't we do that first? Uh, Pat, who do you think is the best supermarket in the country, the first one? Uh, I think Whole Foods. Okay, John? Uh, H-E-B or Wegmans? No, you only get one, you only get one, <laughs> so H-E-B. I'm gonna, say, well, I'm gonna say Wegmans because uh, okay. I'm a little more familiar with them. Okay, Wegmans, Jen? I was gonna say Wegmans. <laughs> Do I have okay, Cat. I was gonna say Wegmans too. <laughs> okay, and, and and Brett. Uh, I'm biased just because I have only shopped there for most of my life, but uh, Jewel. Okay, Jewel, the best Jewel. supermarket. Jewel? I love Jewel. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Jewel? I'm a Jewel ride or die. Okay. Okay. Love it. He hasn't probably Love been it. in very many films. Yeah. Yeah. He, 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 he's just a C store guy. He <laughs> he goes once a year to Jewel. That's all. So so uh, so according to Food and Wine magazine, H E B is number one. So John was almost right, but then he took it back. Wegman's number two. Hi V number three. New Seasons uh, up in the Northwest number four. Market Basket five. Lidl six. Winco seven. That's a surprise to me. Uh, Trader Joe's eight, Publix nine, and Costco 10. I'm shocked that Aldi didn't even make the list. There's all, you know, Phil, there's a million of these studies that really come out every year and, and you know, narrowing anyone down is, is crazy because everything is very regional. Like, 
you know, Brett's answer is really the, the most honest answer. I think we got too much industry knowledge to try and like, you know, read too many of these studies that Wegmans and HEV always bubble at the top for good reasons. But yeah. I think it's a very local decision and it's a very mission driven decision for every shopping trip for food. So, so Pat, um, again, as, as John said, welcome. Pat's going to be with us every Thursday. Um, so welcome to Insight Live, and, and we appreciate you joining us. Uh, why don't you kick us off with the, an update on the, on the chicken wars? We saw a couple months ago where a lot of restaurants were fighting over who's going to have the best chicken sandwich. Then it you know, died down a little bit during COVID-19. What's going on in the chicken wars? Well, Popeye's introduced theirs in uh, the fall of 2019, and it, immediately their same-store sales went way up. And that continued through the fourth quarter and even the first quarter of 2020. So even during the height of the pandemic, people were craving this chicken sandwich. I think it's because everyone really wants comfort food now, or they did up until, you know, like maybe a few weeks ago. And so it really created a lot of buzz and consumers just had this tremendous craving for chicken uh, sandwiches. So they started going to other chains because Popeye's quickly ran out. And so KFC and Chick-fil-A were you know, next on their list. But KFC never thought theirs was up to par. And so they started developing a new one, which kind of paused during the pandemic. But they just released it for test at the end of May. And so they have one that they think can beat Popeyes. And, you know, now the chicken wars are really heating up. There are a lot of smaller players coming in and people are still craving these chicken sandwiches. So Pat, I, and I don't know if you know this, but what's the breakdown between fried chicken sandwiches and broiled chicken sandwiches? Who's, who's doing better? Are people eating the sandwiches because they think it's healthier or it's tastier or, you know, they, they just like the taste of, you know, fried food? No, the fried chicken sandwiches are definitely on top. I mean, the I mean, grilled are fine, but when you're craving crispy fried chicken, that's what you want. <laughs> and as I said, you know, during the pandemic, comfort foods just soared in popularity. So that's why these continue to go up. And so when I was growing up, and I grew up in northern New Jersey, um, in a little town called Belleville, where my grandfather actually had a dairy farm, um, you know, we had chicken delight. And I, I am not going to um, make anybody's ears uh, hurt by singing their jingle, even though it's ringing in my head. Uh, but I want to say that probably twice a month, my parents would get Chicken Delight, um, you know, delivered in, in, this, in this bucket before, you know, anybody ever heard of KFC and so on. Um, why, you know, why are places like um, Chicken Delight not around anymore, Pat? Well, I think these, you know, KFC and Chick-fil-A just had so much more muscle behind expansion. And they were, um, you know, they came about after Chicken Delight. I happen to remember Chicken Delight, too, because I grew up in Queens. And ah, okay. I so, remember so, the jingle. <laughs> but yeah. I so, John, did, did you, you know, grow up on Chicken Delight, too? Sorry, Phil, I did not. I'm, I'm not familiar with Chicken Delight. Oh yeah, so so I'm not going to sing it, but their jingle was "Don't wash those dishes, don't scrub that floor, just pick up the phone and call the man," and something else. Chicken delight. So, so it was it was all about it was all about convenience and helping mom, you know, uh, not have to wash the dishes and scrub that floor. I don't understand why the scrub the floor thing. Uh, so so Kat and Jen and Brett, you guys never had chicken delight, right? Nope, no, ever. Okay. No. Uh, to actually, okay. to actually touch on the the fried chicken conversation, yeah, I actually covered for CSP a few months back how convenience store chains are trying to ramp up their fried chicken programs and how Popeyes, uh, especially with the whole chicken wars, kind of set the stage for all food operators to to have some sort of fried chicken program. Um, so there's C store chains like Parker's and Royal Farms and GPM investments, uh, a lot of chains in the South too, especially, they're investing a lot of time in the building their fried chicken programs because that's, it's so popular right now and Popeye's has really helped build that traction. Have you, have, Brett, have you tasted any of them? Are they good? So I, 
I've tasted not necessarily from the exact brands, but so it, like at the next show, for example, the National Association of Convenience Stores, it's like the the restaurant show for C stores. Uh, every year, all the equipment manufacturers and a lot of the fried chicken suppliers showcase their products, mm-hmm. and it's pretty good. There's this there are a couple uh, Brosters crispy crunchy chicken, uh, K- crispy crunchy chicken actually. Every year at the next show, the line you wait in line for like 30 minutes to get a piece of chicken and biscuits because it's so popular. So uh, it, some of it is really good. Yeah, I will admit. I, I, can, I can say a word for, for Royal Farms Chicken there. That's a famous brand in Maryland mm-hmm. and Delaware, mm-hmm. sure. Yep. Um, a great convenience store food, difficult to eat while you can drive. Yeah. Don't yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. I exactly. actually grew up on high V fried chicken. So we went oh, nice. to the market to get our fried chicken. I think the whole secret to these chicken sandwiches is they're layered with, um, you know, a signature sauce from each of the different players. So that's what differentiates them. But everyone does pickles and the pickles are like the most important component from what I've heard, because they they have to be a certain thickness, a certain degree of crunch, a certain uh, contrasting flavor and texture. So, so who knew pickles were so important? So Jen, you haven't weighed in. What's your favorite, you know, chicken sandwich? Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A, and I like it because there isn't any sauce on it, but I do love the pickles on the Chick-fil-A sandwich. <laughs> okay, so 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 pickles are our winner. Uh, so Brett, tell us what's going on um, over at uh, with Greg Lindenberg. Yeah, so uh, my colleague Greg has covered this really well. So about a week and a half ago, um, Alimentation Kushtard, Hard, which is the the parent company of Circle K Convenience Stores. They uh, initiated a process to sell about to sell more than 1,200 of their C stores that are near Speedway gas stations to eliminate any antitrust concerns, basically over a possible acquisition of Speedway. So Circle K is possibly looking to acquire Speedway, which is huge. Um, and Circle K expects or Kushtar, excuse me, expects to raise about four billion with the sale which would be contingent on the deal to buy all of Speedway's stores. And Speedway operates about 4,000 locations uh, and they are Speedway's owned by Marathon Petroleum. So th- this is big news. I mean, Circle K is the second largest sea store chain in North America. Speedway is the third. And another reason why this is so big is because 7-Eleven, number one, could be involved in this as well. So 7-Eleven in March, uh, Seven and I, which is their Japanese retail group, dropped a bid of about twenty-two billion dollars to acquire Speedway, and they dropped it because of concerns from the from the coronavirus pandemic. But according to some analysts uh, who Greg got in touch with for this story, they said Seven Eleven could be coming back. So, whatever happens with this, I mean, it's the three largest C-store chains in North America, and it's the top two you know, probably going head to head to buy number three. So it's it's really massive news in the C-store industry. So if we if we see a consolidation like this, what happens to the independent uh, C-store operators? And, and when I mean, you know, independent, I'm talking about people like Hubbard's Covered and, you know, just somebody who has between 20 and, and probably 100 stores. Where do they fall with this? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, for this deal specifically, you know, I, I'm not totally sure. I don't think it would have, it would affect them very much. However, you know, those smaller operators, I mean, consolidation, you see the bigger chains and the more and more they try to grow, um, you know, the more these smaller, these smaller operators are maybe not at risk of, of being bought out or, 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 or being part of that consolidation, but um, the chances increase of, of that happening. So let me go to our Facebook page. Uh, Dave Foreman is with us again. Dave, thanks for joining us uh, practically every episode. So I think you're going to get our gold star. Uh, Wear a mask to prevent secondhand spit for the same reason smoking is restricted to minimize secondhand smoke. It's done for other people. Um, I agree with you, Dave, but also it's, you know, I wear my mask for me. I'm doing it for other people, but also I think that, you know, it it helps me out as well. Um, and, uh, and Bill was saying that we had a little glitch with audio problems, but it's been corrected. So Bill, uh, thanks so much for that. And, and John, give us an update on what's going on with Walmart Plus. I mean, we've been hearing a lot about uh, Walmart Plus, what it is, what it isn't. Um, I don't think that they've given us you know, anything official yet, but I know you have your ear to the ground on this one. 
I do. And I even listened to Janie Whiteside do an interview on LinkedIn live yesterday in hopes of hearing something more about it. And she said, no, I'm not allowed to say anything about it yet. But uh, Walmart Plus, real, real quick, it's a membership program that would rival something like Amazon Prime that would give the shoppers any number of perks that would kind of cut across all the different things that Walmart does, uh, delivery, um, you know, uh, They've got streaming television now in certain forms that they're they're playing around with. Walmart's doing all kinds of interesting things worldwide, and there's some speculation that there could be elements of that. For example, the the big investment they made in India was really uh, not just a, for the retailer Flipkart, but sort of this what they talk about this ecosystem that as a mobile uh, pay unit that they're interested in, and and it does marketing and you know many other things through that and. You know, this kind of helps stretch them out. You know, the, the question with Walmart is always with these things is, you know, is it compatible with the everyday low price and the Sam Walton, um, you know, ethos that's driven them to such great success over the last 60 years? Um, and, you know, I, I, Walmart's clever and, and we'll figure out a way to do this in a Walmart way, but we just got to wait on the details. Um, right now, they're offering a $98, what they call Delivery Unlimited, which uh, will allow uh, you know online grocery shoppers to get deliveries uh, for for that one price. That's sort of what Walmart Plus is to be built around. This is according to reporting, um, uh, mostly from Recode. He's been all over the story, but uh, it, you know you listen to Walmart and you put the pieces together, and it all seems like it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. So, John, l- let's go back a couple years um, when Walmart bought Jet.com. And obviously, they had high hopes for Jet. Um, it was trying to be more upscale than Walmart. How much influence do you think that you know buying Jet.com with that intelligence, with those learnings, and so on, is really fueling both Walmart and Walmart Plus? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, Jet as a business didn't really succeed the way Walmart had hoped it would, but. You know, they got their their e-commerce CEO, Mark Laurie, out of that, of course, and he's a, you know, seminal genius of uh, the the uh, digital commerce age uh, that really brought Walmart's uh, dot-com business, you know, really forward in a, in a quick way. And, you know, it cost them billions of dollars, but um, I think that they would all tell you this was a success, despite the fact that, that they couldn't establish Jet as an urban brand to serve New Yorkers and coastal elites that Walmart had a t- tough time uh, reaching before then. And so, yeah, that's all playing into their strategy. They've got, you know, their eyes on being uh, every everything Amazon is and more if they can and do it in a Walmart way. You know, the, the one thing that was interesting about Jet that oh, made it such a great uh, match for Walmart was that they applied this, this EDLP sort of uh, architecture to it, whereas you built your basket, the, the prices went down because it incorporated the uh, efficiencies of batching orders and delivering them and all those things that retailers have now learned about sort of doing e-commerce. So that was a very Walmart thing. They've, they've taken these learnings, they've taken Mark Laurie, they've, uh, and, and they're off and running. So, you know, I remember having a conversation with um, Carmela Cugini, who was then head of food at, at Jet, and uh, she shared with me something very interesting that I'd never thought about, um, that most of their um, customers at that point in time, and I'm talking about Jet, not Walmart, um, were, you know, women aged 25 to 35, they had a kid or two, and they would actually do their grocery shopping after 10 p.m. Uh, because that's when the kids were asleep, they could relax, they, they could just do it. And, and for me, that was like a, wow, you know, I, I never thought about that. So, um, Jen, you know, it, it's up to you to give us some good news. Okay, I'm happy to do it. Um, Giant Food just announced, or, sorry, the Giant Company just announced that um, they're doing this cool reusable bag program. And initially, I was like, reusable bags when you can't use reuse bags right now? Right, right. And, Actually might be a brilliant timing because they're selling the bags for 99 cents each and then 50 cents of those of each purchase will go to um, nonprofits in their communities that support uh, eliminating hunger children 
and a healthier planet. So it would be nice if, if everyone bought a bag or two when each time they shopped. To support yeah. The causes. yeah, I think that's not only a great idea, but I think that's a great model that every retailer should be doing. Um, you know, they're, they're giving a lot to Feeding America, not enough, uh, because Feeding America still has problems as, as more people are going on unemployment and losing their health insurance and the like. Uh, but but I, I agree with you. That's some, that's some great news. Uh, so thank you all for joining us today on Winsight Live. Um, also, don't forget that now um, you can find Winsight Live on Winsight Grocery Business, on CSP, on Food Service, and on Supermarket Guru, both on our Facebook pages and the websites itself. So until we meet again, uh, Tuesday, 12.30 p.m. Eastern, 9.30 a.m., Pacific time. Have a great weekend. Wear your mask. I can't find mine anymore. Hold on. Hold on. You know, wear your mask, no matter, even if you're in your office all by yourself, uh, wear your mask, uh, be safe, and we'll see you on Tuesday. Have a great weekend.